Yeah, I, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, can you uh, can you guys hear me at the back end, the audio as well? Yeah. Okay. Great. So then, Vladimir, you can start. Uh, if there are any questions, I will unmute and ask the audience to let me know, and I can read the questions uh, related them to you. Okay. So, uh, hello, guys. My name is Vladimir Kananovic, and today I would like to tell you about a very interesting story that has happened in the end of 2017 with a well-known ATM vendor. Uh, yeah, I know three years already uh, gone, and uh, you can ask me one question why uh, just after three years but uh, it's an ATM, so everything depends on vendors. And uh, those of you who were here, uh, I mean in uh, HUG, in, at this conference in 2018, can remember another story with another vendor, NCR. Uh, but this time it uh, will be much more interesting. So let's start. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so who I am? Uh, I work in positive technologies and my hobby and my job is reverse engineering. At work, I'm finding vulnerabilities in different PLCs, ATMs, IoT devices. At home, I'm doing reverse engineering of old school TV games writing different uh, compression, decompression tools, uh, level editors, and so on. Uh, also, I'm creating plugins for IDA and Jydra to make uh, different uh, reverse engineering processes easier. Uh, also, I want to say that uh, this project would not be possible without the second guy, Alexei Stenikov. Uh, and unfortunately, he wasn't able to be here. So let me introduce him too. Alexei Stenikov is a hardware expert. All hardware-related stuff in this project uh, is his job. Also, he's an awesome ATM post-security researcher. And uh, before I start the story, first I should tell you about ATM hardware internals. Uh, for the current speech, it's enough to say that an ATM consists of uh, two parts upper less secure part uh, which is usable usually attackable by malware writers and the second part uh, it's a safe zone this uh, zone is uh, locked by a physical key has uh, usually has a strong protection against different physical forces and so on and uh, the only connection between the upper and lower parts are few usb cables so if you don't want to have any connection with the malware stuff, uh, you can make a hole, but don't do this, in this yellow uh, plastic shell, plug out the required USB cable and plug in it into your laptop and uh, run a script. Also, this method uh, can hide an attacker from what he actually did at the specific ATM uh, there will be no logs, no executed commands lead somewhere, just a uh, uh, record about the USB dispenser. Uh, and uh, this is what is usually called black box attack. You can apply it to any ATM of the specific model and you have to, don't have to deal with the USB rolling and session keys. So to be sure you have all the information about uh, ATM internals, different ATM attack types and what is black box, I'd also recommend you open this video. Uh, there, me and Alexei already covered most of these topics. Uh, and uh, this video also includes a, an awesome speech <laughs> about one NC NCR dispenser vulnerability. And uh, you can also find this link at the uh, organizers of this conference website. So before we'll begin, let me show you two funny pictures uh, with uh, some extra top secret stuff. 
uh, here is it. And uh, yeah, actually we have a problem and uh, problem not only one, but we have five of them. And uh, uh, this is actually what I'm going to tell you about in my speech. So first item in this list is an ability to perform a firmware downgrade. It is actually related uh, to the second item, uploading of any firmware you want to be at the current ATM. Um, the next item is a smart card denial of service, which uh, can be called the smart card feature. Uh, I will tell you about it uh, a little bit later. So also because all the USB traffic is actually encrypted, uh, one of the profits of two first items in this list is uh, actually bypassing that encryption. And uh, as a result of all of the previous steps, uh, we can make a money withdrawal. So uh, it was a project in one bank uh, where we got two files. One had a BTR extension, which is bootloader, and the next one was uh, had the FRM extension, which is firmware. And uh, after opening them in any hex editor, you will see something like that, like at this slide. Uh, as you can see at the left image, uh, it has some size marked yellow, and after it, uh, goes some stream that can be a name of this uh, firmware file. And uh, after it, uh, you have some random byte stuff, which is, which are unknown for now. And then the end of the firmware, uh, right side of the slide, uh, you can, you have a structure that can be actually parsed manually just by looking at it. Uh, it includes device ID, PID, vendor ID, some unknown bytes, and uh, it, it also includes UFD tag, which uh, is actually DFU. Maybe you know, uh, device from where upgrade, uh, it's an, uh, it's a protocol. Uh, well, well known. So at this moment, it was everything we had and uh, trying to unpack, decrypt and do other things with that random bytes had have no success. So this project could not be unfinished. And uh, actually it could not uh, because we asked eBay to help us. Uh, Alexei had ordered the dispensers control and mainboard. So it was our hope to continue. Also, I had this PCB right here. Let me show you. Uh, yeah, like that. And uh, let me show you one funny video uh, using this PCB. Yeah. Uh, it's an astronomia, and uh, this video actually demonstrates an exploitation of the firmware encryption bypassing vulnerability, which is the topic of uh, my speech. Uh, and here I've sent a speaker playing commands via encrypted uh, USB protocol. I hope copyrights uh, are okay here. <laughs> I mean about this song. Yeah, like that. So after we had the PCB, Alexei started uh, to look for any debugging things at it. And uh, here is uh, the result, GTAC pinout. Uh, and as you can see, it is just placed near the main CPU. 
So another interesting stuff at this board is a smart card. And uh, it's responsible for many things uh, here, like uh, USB traffic keys generation, session numbers checking, and other counters. It also stores a few certificates, and uh, all of this will be covered a little bit later. And uh, as you can see at the slide, using a smart card, someone can make the whole system unusable by its one feature. But uh, it's easy to restore uh, the system by just uh, reinitializing that uh, Java applet. Uh, sure, it requires the manufacturing keys, which are only known to the vendor. So uh, there was a possibility also that uh, something could be broken at this PCB. So only a powering it on and connecting via USB can tell us uh, the truth. So uh, uh, the first powering was actually successful. And uh, then we decided to check the board with uh, the vendor software. And it's written in Java, so it was uh, very easy to de decompile it, uh, find uh, different self-testing stuff and just check it against our PCB. And uh, here we also had a success. So it means uh, this board is actually works perfect. Uh, but uh, one uh, uh, question can appear, how this board uh, appeared at eBay? And the uh, answer is actually uh, simple. If uh, something doesn't work in any part of the whole ATM dispenser, uh, usually nobody checks for the actual problem and they, they will just buy a new dispenser. And uh, old ones, uh, old parts of the dispenser sometimes appear at uh, different marketplaces. So uh, what are the internals of the dispenser controller? In our case, uh, it has three STM CPUs and uh, it was easy to find uh, data sheets and dump all the required regions. Two other CPUs were dumped too, but uh, all the interesting stuff was only is the, in the main CPU. And uh, the first thing that we were looking for was a firmware decryption code, because as I told you before, our firmware files were encrypted. So I loaded the dump into IDA, and after some time, I found this this code. Uh, not actually code, but this information. Uh, this is an actual firmware decryption algorithm. As you can see, it is based on the XTAA modification. And uh, the only modification is a different delta constant, uh, which is uh, seems to be random and cannot be Googled. So we cannot uh, be sure it is safely generated or not. So uh, to make the XDA initial state, the firmware reads uh, first uh, five words just after the firmware name string and uh, applies the follow magic uh, in these three items uh, using two external arrays key zero which is uh, marked blue and uh, key one which is um, green here uh, these names are my names so maybe vendor has different names for them. So it was an initializing step. And the next step is actual decryption. Uh, here, the firmware just uses uh, previously initialized key and data things in, uh, let me show you, uh, third item and second, uh, yeah. And uh, 
this is just a typical mass for the XTA algorithm. And uh, also the firmware checks for the full FF words in the end uh, as the mark of the decryption process end. So that's it, but it is not the end of the decryption process itself. Uh, the last part is uh, APLIB unpacking. Uh, the firmware has many sequential APLIB blocks. And uh, the last one is marked as a full, one full effect word uh, to tell the firmware where to stop to unpack. And now uh, we have all the firmware code. Uh, you have to just uh, join unpacked APLE blocks and have the full firmware that you can actually load into IDA and uh, analyze. So the only question here is uh, where I got this key zero and key one constants to decrypt uh, something. Uh, let's take a look. During the firmware analysis, we found that it reads uh, those keys from the 64 hex region. And uh, the right side, you can see its content and uh, two parts marked uh, with different color uh, are actual key zero and key one. And the left uh, part of the slide, you can uh, see the code that gets into account these keys and uses them. There is also a strange dead uh, signature, that tag, but it will be covered a little bit later. So we almost have everything to make our own firmware files for now. And the next part I want to tell you about is uh, firmware signing, because we try to modify something like strings and upload new firmware, but got uh, an error. So uh, signing here is uh, self-signing, which is really bad practice. Uh, and uh, I would not recommend it to use because the only usage of it is checking for consistency, but not for protecting something. The firmware has a signature part, which is marked green, and an RSA modules part, which is marked blue. And uh, they are actually integers, and their length is specified at a 30-bit tokens count. So as a result, you can use RSA keys of any length that can be placed in these uh, offsets listed uh, the left side. This picture, we used our small customer say, uh, 512 bits key lens. So uh, for now, we have uh, everything resigned, re-encrypted, uh, repacked from where. And the last step is to upload it into the device. So if you remember, I told you about UFD or DFU tag. And uh, here is the device and how it looks in the device manager. Its speed, uh, product ID is actually a normal PID with uh, the most significant bit set. So here is it, uh, 4101 and uh, the DFU device has uh, C101 uh, product ID. So the vendor software sends the diffu detach command and then executes the USB cycle port command. It disables uh, these two devices, uh, which are below here. And instead of them, one diffu device appears. So after we successfully uploaded our firmware and before the withdrawal process, I would like to tell you about that uh, dead uh, checking stuff. Just after a file name in the header and after those five words, headed words, the firmware looks for a special dead tag, which may contain an offset to the key zero and corresponding key one. 
Uh, let me show you that screenshot again. As you can see, uh, the dump contains a lot of zeroed areas. Uh, they are red. And uh, we can point at them by this dead feature. So we think that this stuff was added uh, to check for old or other keys. And we can use this offset to encrypt our firmware without the knowledge of actual key zero and key one. So we also created a brute force uh, EOC script that uh, allowed us to find an exact zeroed area offset. For now, let's summarize what we already know from all the previous slides. Uh, this list uh, actually means that we have everything to change and upload an original but uh, fixed firmware. And in the next part of the speech, I would like to talk uh, about the smart card and its role in Winker uh, default mixer dispensers like RM3 and CMD V5. And uh, everything I will talk about will just mean only one thing. Uh, their anti-black box protection is uh, really awesome. I really like it. So nobody can just uh, sniff and repeat ATM operations, uh, traffic to take any money. So the only usage of the smart card in these dispensers models uh, is USB communications so with the uh, ATM PC, which in the upper part. So, and uh, it consists of three following items. Uh, first one is base key initialization. It is required when all session keys or a base key was leaked or lost uh, somehow. The next uh, item is new session keys generation. This step I can call uh, rolling keys at their maximum. <laughs> and uh, the next item is session counters uh, synchronizing. Uh, I will talk about it in the uh, next slides. So let's talk about the first item. Basically, to drive a base key, you need all of these uh, certificates to be uploaded into a smart card. Uh, the exact process is much harder, includes uh, TPM usage, key storage stuff, and other PC related things. So we, as a possible attacker, don't have them and uh, actually don't need them. But I must say that I really love what and how they implement it. So uh, the next step uh, is the new session keys generation. It requires previously generated base key and can be performed for every four directions, which are listed uh, below. As you can see at this slide, the firmware and the PC can get a new session key using their own ways. This happens because the smart card doesn't know anything about the base key and uh, because uh, TPM chip is only at the PC motherboard. So cannot be accessed uh, by firmware. The next step is uh, session counters uh, synchronizing. And uh, it may be required if the PC and the smart card counters are different. So the whole scheme is presented at this slide. Like that. So regarding the denial of service, there is an ability to ask a smart card to generate a new session key for a specific session counter that must not, must not be less or equal than previous one. So then we decided to check what can happen if we'll ask the smart card to generate a new key for a session that is equal to the maximum integer. And uh, the answer is uh, actually nothing good. 
because uh, that key was actually generated. Uh, but after we asked the smart card to give us a new key, uh, it's returned the status about uh, duplicate session number, which means uh, the same session usage. So, and the problem is that we can't increment uh, this maximum integer. That's it. But as I told you before, this uh, can be easily fixed. So it is not a vulnerability, but a feature. So before the final step, uh, let's summarize what we know about the USB communications between the dispenser and the PC. And uh, the, as a conclusion, I can say that uh, this imp implementation is the strongest one I've ever seen. Yeah, that's uh, true. Uh, and uh, this one feature, which is uh, number five, uh, cannot change it. So uh, to perform a final step, a money withdrawal, we had to do some preparations. Uh, as we can change and upload our custom firmware, we can patch it uh, to not ask the smart card for a new session key, but just use some dummy array like uh, filled with zeros and uh, then upload this firmware to the device. The next step was to find the same place in the Java code and use uh, the same dummy array uh, there too. Uh, also, we had to fix uh, two functions uh, which uh, named cache in and cache out uh, because they check, uh, checked for some configurations which are not required actually. Uh, then we synchronize action counters uh, between our laptop and the smart card. Uh, this was made because uh, we didn't want to uh, command or change a lot of uh, Java code just to check uh, withdrawal possibility. So the next step is to upload new cassettes configurations uh, to the dispenser to tell it uh, where we that we have some amount uh, of banknotes in uh, specific cassettes. And uh, then we call the function prepare cache out and then called cache out uh, with specific values like a cassette number and banknotes amount. Uh, then we got a uh, dispenser that started to buzz. So after some time, uh, we called uh, open method for a shutter object. Shutter object uh, can be accessed uh, via USB command too. And uh, at uh, our first try, we forgot to open the shutter. So after cash out, we got uh, the banknotes were closed <laughs> by it. So then we uh, called shutter open, got the money. Uh, and uh, just closed the shutter back. That's it. And uh, this is a short history of these vulnerabilities, uh, one for a single device like ROM3 and CMD5. Findings, testings, uh, testing and confirming process. Regarding uh, CVEs, uh, status changing from registered to released. Yeah, it's in progress for now. So uh, for now we have Russian Mitra uh, variant IDs. Uh, that's it. So thank you for watching, for listening. If you have any questions, uh, yeah, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask or send me them at uh, my email. Uh, that's it. Yeah. Thank you, Vladimir.